Hello everyone, uh, nice to uh, see you again and uh, today is uh, week five and uh, we're going to discuss uh, a new topic uh, and the new topic is a very very important concept in object-oriented programming uh, which is called inheritance. Perhaps you already know how to use inheritance from your C++ courses but in this course in this particular lecture we'll be talking about the details of inheritance and and when you have to be using it and okay, what are the important features of inheritance in any object programming language. So we'll, we'll be discussing about the concept of inheritance in this class and its uh, usable cases mm -hmm. as well. And of, of course, we'll be uh, demonstrating this concept uh, using Java programming language. So in detail, uh, we'll be talking about how you can go and create uh, new classes based on the existing ones, okay, and then uh, we basically talk about the notions of superclasses and subclasses and the way how they relate to each other okay uh, statically uh, we also talk about uh, how java actually uh, implements this concept uh, using a special keyword called extends and certain um, behaviors from uh, that how it can like inherit certain attributes and behaviors uh, from other classes we also talk about a new access modifier. We haven't discussed this very previously, and this access modifier is called protected. We'll see when, uh, what uh, kind, of, what level of access to the attributes and uh, methods this particular uh, access modifier uh, applies. So we'll we'll discuss about this access modifier, and we'll discuss about the restrictions of using this particular access modifier, um, uh, and so forth. Um, also, we'll talk about how one, how the subclass, okay, the child class can go and talk to the superclass through a special keyword called super. We'll just discuss about that uh, topic as well. And at the end of um, our lecture, we'll quickly review um, the way how objects are created using uh, the chain of constructors, okay, that um, uh, in Java and in any, any programming language. And then we'll discuss, we'll look into the uh, different um, overridable methods of object class. And uh, we'll talk about object class in general at the end of this lecture. It's a pretty particularly important class uh, uh, that is uh, basically uh, uh, the, the core of the, the, the central part of the Java uh, programming language. And we'll talk about uh, its important uh, methods. Okay, so what is inheritance? Okay, why do we need inheritance in the first place? So imagine that uh, you have, uh, let's say, you have some module that is written in um, in any programming language, and then uh, and most of the time, most of the time, this module actually does all the work that you need to do, right? Let's say this module does the payroll; it computes the the salaries for for different types of employees, right? And now um, Okay, now and, and, and the manager comes to you and says, "Okay, you know what? Uh, let's 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 we are hiring a new type of employees, and the way how we are going to compute the salary for these employees are employ, um, employees are, are going to be different. It's going to be slightly different from what we've been doing so far. So, and in this case, like uh, you just need to make this small modification on top of what we have already. Okay, so." Yeah, I mean, in a, in a procedure-oriented world, perhaps you might go and call some methods, right? Um, uh, the, the ones that you've implemented previously and just embellish them with additional logic and then return uh, the ones that uh, basically rely on the, the, the methods that you've been using before and also uh, add something new on top of those methods and then return some, some new kind of salary for that, for that uh, new type of employees, right? Uh, but in an object-oriented world, we, talk, we, we don't work with the methods exactly. We, we work with entities. We work with, uh, we work with objects, right? The real entities, the world entities. And everything that is uh, surrounding us in the real world, in the business world, or in a particular problem, they can be, uh, let's say, encapsulated into a particular class, into a particular entity. <laughs> and... The instances of this entity are we call them objects, right? As objects exhibit different behavior based on their different methods, right? So, uh, so 
but okay, so so far we, our system was working fine, right? So all of the employees they were getting their salaries computed correctly, and they were exhibiting all the uh, like salary computation behavior, you so call it, is correctly, right? But now we have a new employee, right? And this new employee does the salary computation in exactly the same way. So let's let's just for simplicity, let's discuss. Let's just name. Uh, the previous employees as commission-based employees, and their salaries are computed as a percentage from their sales, right? And um, and then we got a new employee, new type of an employee. Let's call it a base salary commission uh, employee. So what it does is it um, this particular type of employee's salary is not just a percentage, but it has some baseline salary as well, like something that adds. To, these, to his total salary outside his all kind of sales he does, right? So, so this is again, this is a slightly different modification to our system. So what should we do? Should we go and re-implement this whole okay, salary computation mechanism for this new employee again? And then on top of it, we should okay add this something new that we would like to do. In this case, we have a problem, right? We have the problem of duplicating the exact existing code, duplicating the existing uh, uh, logic over and over again. And this, this is going to cause a lot of problems in the future because if our management comes and says, we don't want this particular change here, like we would like to change the percentage, let's say, for, from commission for all employees from, let's say, 11 to 15, then you have to go and make this change everywhere, right? And, and every type of an employee, and that's obviously tedious and it, it will cause a lot of maintenance issues in the future. And, and the fact that you are basically repeating the same logic over and over again should be a big uh, code smell, okay, in your, uh, in, your co in, your, in, your, in your program. So you should basically avoid doing this kind of thing. You should, you should be looking into uh, the way how you could reuse the existing functionality. And the concept of inheritance actually comes into play in order to make our time, uh, save our time in program development, because now we can reuse the existing code, we can reuse the existing classes, and then reuse their functionality, reuse their way of interacting with the world, okay? And, and simply just embellish, decorate, uh, 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 some parts of our cl new classes, so they kind of behave mostly in the same way as the existing classes, but in some aspects, they just exhibit slightly different behavior, okay? That's our main objective. That That's what we were trying to ach achieve, and that happens a lot when you do the software development. You, you always need to think about, okay, what happens if something gets changed, right? And things get changed. You don't you don't make a solid, let's say you don't make a uh, like a monolithic software, okay, where one change is going to cause a catastrophe. So you should be always thinking in from that from that perspective, what happens if something gets something is going to be different in this particular context, okay? What if this context is different from this context and how I'm going to manage these differences? Okay, so in this case, you might be looking uh, towards uh, using the inheritance and, and finding out what is Okay, um, what can be reused and what cannot be? Um, okay, what is, uh, let's say, the concept of, again, okay, finding out what is inheritance basically boils down to the concept of what is general to this group of, let's say, entities and what is not general, what is special to this group of uh, entities. So you're basically grouping certain entities in your world, okay, and then find figuring out what is basically general to them Right? What behavior is general? Like you expect this particular behavior equally from this uh, group of uh, entities, and what is specific to particular entities? So you just need to be asking these kind of questions before you go and uh, dive into the idea of inheritance. But as it said before, inheritance helps you to reuse the existing functionality, and okay, uh, and obviously it helps you to. Uh, make things much more debuggable, much more uh, scalable, okay, and, and maintainable, okay? So, like, three important things here, right? Reusability, maintainability, and scalability.
So the, we, and, and inheritance actually provides these, these three important okay features in your in your programming. So let's get into the details of the idea of inheritance, and we can um, okay uh, so that, that we can discuss it further. So before we get into it, we, we just need to come up with uh, the vocabulary that we're going to use for uh, uh, to discuss this idea. So the existing class that I've been discussing before is is called normally it's called a superclass or sometimes people call it parent class. Okay, but again in Java world it's it's mostly called a superclass. And the new class that you would like to okay uh, uh, create from the existing class is called a subclass or a child class. Right. So and the subclass can be a superclass as well in the future. So they, 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 that doesn't stop. Okay, subclass being a, 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 a superclass, and the superclass itself can be a child class of some other superclass. So there is some sort of a hierarchical relationship here in this in this perspective, right? We can see this kind of a parent-child relationship between the classes, right? So subclass can add its own. So subclass can be more specific, right? So it can have can it can differ from this uh, superclass, and it can have its own fields and methods. Uh, which which which, are, which might not exist in the superclass, right? But the subclass must have exactly the same interface as the superclass, right? So we'll discuss about this idea more uh, uh, in detail. But the idea is the subclass should be should contain exactly the same interface as the superclass. But superclass is not necessarily needs to have the same interface as the subclass. Subclass can have more fields and more uh, methods. And a subclass is more specific in its in its uh, in its definitions, right? So we discussed that. Um, so and the, 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 and the subclass exhibits a more kind of a specific behavior to subclass. I mean, to to, to the classes, and the, and the superclass exhibits more generalized behavior. Okay, so things like you expect. Uh, let's say, uh, let me give you another example where, let's say, you can. Expect so consider like the taxonomy of, of animals, for example, right? So every animal, um, you can go, go and generalize different types of animals, right? So you've got animals kingdom, right? And and then what is the general behavior for an animal, right? So it's something that should be general for all different all different types of animals, right? They live or they let's say breed, okay, something like that. And then you got some mammals, right? And the mammals are are they have certain unique features that distinguish them from the rest of the animals, right? The, the mammals have a backbone. The mammals, uh, let's say, they, they give birth, right? They don't lay eggs. And 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 they can, like, say, they can walk, right? Most of them, uh, they can walk, right? So, yeah, of course, like the whales, uh, they can't walk. But uh, you, you can go and find out, like, different uh, common features, the common behavior like for, for all different mammals, right? So they have both, they can see, let's say, something like that in the way like most uh, mammals see. So all of these things, uh, they, are, they constitute the different, uh, the generalized behavior for mammals and the mammals can get can, can be classified into subgroups as well, like, I don't know, dogs and, 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 and uh, cats and then different families, right? So the dog's family uh, and they can call, they can, Let's say they can woof and uh, and the uh, cats can can mew and, and so forth, right? So and their behavior will specialize as you go down through this hierarchy from the animal to this one, and they might have more more and more uh, behavior, more and more specific behavior in that sense, right? Like so that that basically specifies so that that kind of explains why some subclasses will have more uh, methods and fields compared to their superclasses because superclasses are the ge just generalized features and and this is how you're going to kind of construct your uh, world uh, in, in, in your using this programming language how you're going to see these entities and describe these kind of behaviors and properties that might uh, share across different subclasses right so uh, again, another uh, uh, word that we're going to use is the direct subclass means like the, there is a direct parent-child relationship between the classes. So it's just a direct descendant of the superclass. Uh, the subclass, if the subclass is a direct descendant of a of a uh, of a superclass, 
then uh, it's called a direct sub uh, um, a direct sub uh, subclass. Or I mean, did, uh, if for the from the perspective of a subclass, it's called a direct superclass. Uh, so uh, again, in, in, in the form of an example, uh, animal and uh, and we were going to specialize animals into mammals and and birds and let's say fishes. Then we can say that mammal, uh, mammals superclass, direct superclass is an animal, and and uh, animals direct subclass is uh, is a is a mammal or fish or bird. Okay. So they can, they, this kind of relationship can continue and they can have an indirect relationship, right? So for example, I can say the horse is, uh, is just an indirect, uh, the indirect superclass of a horse is an animal, right? It, can, it, ha it is first a mammal and then is an animal, but okay, animal and the horse, uh, they, they have a class kind of hierarchical relationship in that perspective. So they, they have this indirect uh, relationship in this, in this perspective. So uh, the Java class hierarchy begins with the uh, with with the object, right? So like like the animal hierarchy we discussed in Java, everything is an object, right? This this is a very famous say, saying in in the, in the Java world. People say in Java everything is an object, and this has like a like a uh, it's a dubious meaning, okay? Uh, first of all, okay, uh, you might consider every in a, in a running program everything is an object, right? It, it, in, the, in the in the true sense of the word object, right? So so because it's just objects interacting with each other and then they're doing something meaningful and reasonable and functional. So that's how we see uh, the program in an object-oriented world in general, like the way how objects interact with each other and and and, and produce something meaningful. But again, when it comes to Java, okay, um, uh, there is a class called object. Okay, this is this this name of the class is an object. Okay, and this object is the the parent class. Okay, it's the forefather of all objects. Okay, all classes in Java that you define. It's a forefather. So anything that you define in any class that you define in Java is an extension of object class. So you just need to understand it's implicit. You, if you, you don't normally go and do this extension uh, explicitly. It is implicit. You don't have to write it. It's not embedded into the syntax of Java code. But you need to understand that any class that you define, they inherit from the object class. So it means that the objects, all of the object classes public interface can be further overridden or can be further used uh, in uh, in your current class. I will be talking about this at the end of the lecture. You're going to see which methods we can go and use, which object classes methods we can use in our current class, or how we can go and override. We'll talk about what is override, but again, uh, uh, we'll see how we can go and do this uh, in uh, with the object uh, class. But so you can go and uh, like uh, say everything is an is an object in Java, and you have to understand two things. Okay, like in a running program, in a running program, everything is an object, and uh, and, and in, in a not running in a in a, in a source code, everything is an object too. Okay, so in both perspectives, in the static and the dynamic cases, we can consider object class as everything is object. Okay, so Java supports only a single inheritance, and it is another important uh, concept we have to use, and we'll discuss why it's a single inheritance and how you can uh, have uh, this kind of idea to be extended um, uh, with the idea of a polymorphism interfaces. We'll talk about uh, this kind of ideas in the next lecture, but in, in, in Java, what we, we can do is only we can inherit from the single class not from multiple classes and uh, and this basically prevents us from like having uh, let's say having a strict uh, like having ambiguities in our code and it basically have a one strict hierarchy of of uh, classes and the way how they are uh, related to each other so we can basically eliminate set types of ambiguities by using a single inheritance so what, what kind of ambiguity I'm talking about? 
let's say you got two class. I mean, it, what, what what would happen if there were two classes? Like from two, the class can go and inherit from two classes. Let's say there are two classes. Let's say um, and then this uh, I don't know. Like the um, the class A can uh, class animal, and there are two classes. Let's say animal and, and, and insects, right? And let's say uh, they they both can let's say reproduce, or let's say not reproduce. Let's say walk. It can be it can be another way saying walk. Animal can walk. An insect can walk, right? But the way how they walk is different, right? And um, let's say one there's a one class, it's a mutant, something like that, or hybrid class, which inherits from both these classes. So and then if, if it wants to use a walk method, like then whose walk method it's going to use? The insects or or the uh, the, the, the the animals. Uh, because the, the way how the walk is implemented in these two classes is, is different. And obviously this kind of ambiguity should be resolved within the language. Uh, if the multiple inheritance should be is allowed, but Java kind of eliminates this sort of in, in, in ambiguities and does just single inheritance. And we'll talk about okay uh, how this kind of how a method reuse from the exist from the existing from the inherited class from the superclass uh, can be done uh, in, in Java we'll, uh, later on in this particular lecture. Okay, um, so when we talk about reusing uh, objects, okay, reusing a certain type of functionality, we need to understand that this is not the only way we can reuse something, right? There can be two different ways of reusing the existing functionality, right, of the objects. Uh, and this re reuse object uh, functionality reuse can be described in, in, in two different types of relationships. There is a relationship and there has a relationship. So we already discussed the has a relationship in the previous lecture. We said that it is composition or sometimes it's called association, right? So association is kind of a broader sense of uh, referencing. So in this case, one object contains as a member the other objects, right? So because the, this object contains the other objects as a member, it can go and use its public methods, right? So it can go and do the, some reuse, uh, okay? Reuse the existing code like this. It's as if like you're calling some methods from some outside module. Right? That's kind of a standard way, uh, like procedure-oriented way, how you could uh, uh, reuse the existing uh, functionality by calling some other methods. Right? This is this, but uh, this is how you're basically doing those things. Uh, so with it has a relationship. It's a, it's it's a, an association, a composition in, in our in our world, because let's say the the student has a, a, like has an address, or student has a mobile phone something like that, then the mobile phone and the address are different, let's say, different objects. So you can go and uh, describe objects in this way and the way how they reuse each other's functionality. But uh, the inheritance now introduces a new way of reusing things, okay? They're using uh, uh, the functionality and it's called, it can be described with an ease-a relationship. In this perspective, uh, what is an ease-a relationship? Let's say, the object of a subclass can also be treated as an object of its superclass. So in an analogy case, again, like in an ex animal's example, like we have animal, right? And we have mammals and we've got a horse and a dog. Uh, so if I, I can treat the dog as a dog, I can tell the dog, um, okay, to woof and the dog will do the woof, right? But, okay, because I know that the dog is, is an animal as well, I can treat the, 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 the dog as an animal too. So dog is an animal, dog is a dog, dog is a mammal, and dog is an animal, right? So we can use this is a relationship towards this sub subclass called dog. We can use it, okay, uh, to higher, to, to its super classes. We can use this is a uh, relationship word uh, for dog. We can say dog is a dog, yeah, it's because it's described as a subclass of a dog, but because this subclass of a dog inherits from the mammals, we can say, okay, dog is a mammal or dog is a, an animal. And by saying so, 
what we, we mean is that okay all the functions that are implemented in these upper classes okay in these parent classes they should be they should apply to subclasses as well right so uh, for example if animals can walk right then the mammals should also be able to walk and obviously the dog should also be able to walk right because if i can treat dog as an animal then i can ask the animal to walk and but if i ask the animal to walk then what i mean what i mean is okay i want my dog to walk right that that's what i mean because my, if animal can any animal can walk then the dog can also walk that's that's the idea right so that uh, kind of function reuse if go if animal goes and implements the walk method and this is a generally generalized walk method let's say right and then there's a little bit specific way of walking for mammals and then there's more specific way of walking for for dogs right but again uh the point is they they all of them can walk right and maybe okay the mammal can reuse the existing the generalized method for walking uh, uh, and it can slightly embellish it the way how the mammals would uh, uh, walk. And if I go further down, I can go and uh, slightly decorate the way how mammals walk into okay uh, into how dogs walk. So again, my idea, my logic builds one on top the, off of the other. I'm reusing my parent class's implementation of a walk. Okay, while I'm implementing the dog's walk method. So again. This is this is the this way of reuse is slightly different from the way of reusing the code that we normally do like in, in a procedure oriented way where we call, just simply call the methods and just get things done okay we are using but we are not just reusing we are just enhancing the things that we are specializing i wouldn't say enhancing we're specializing the general things into more specific things by just relying on what has been done on the general part and then just slightly more modifying the existing one and then just returning more special okay more uh, ad hoc okay answers to those kind of contexts okay that's that's that sort of reuse is slightly different but you need to understand that there is a hierarchical relationship in the way how you're reusing the code okay try to understand uh, the difference between the composition type reuse and the inheritance type reuse composition type reuse similar to what we call function calls inheritance type reuse again it still does the function calls but the way how it does it uh it's it's it, it is more like an enhancement improvement or more special specialized kind of way of uh, reusing things okay so it is um uh it can be represented with an easier relationship right okay so uh yeah, we got different examples okay here uh, uh, that can be described as this one. So this examples, as I said, so we can say the superclass could be a student, but the students can be divided into graduate students and undergrad students, and undergrad students can be further divided into sophomores, freshmen, juniors, and and, and seniors. Okay, so we can go and do further for, and further spe specialization uh, from from top to the bottom, right? And, and 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 the question is should we go and do this kind of specialization further okay when should we stop okay so the question is okay when the when when, when there is no context where where uh, you would like to distinguish okay the whether it is a student uh, which kind of student it is or whether uh, the, the the behavior of these uh, different students uh, kind of differs so like you need to stop when you don't need any more specialization because at that level uh, the behavior of this type of entity is exactly the same as let's say uh, the behavior of a different type of entity for example i have undergrad students right and i and i assume that undergrad students uh, uh, the way how i'm modeling these undergraduate students okay their behavior should be identical to juniors sophomores and and freshmen so I don't care. I don't have to go and do more specialization, unless if I if I expect, let's say, from from sophomores to be to have additional, let's say, additional um, uh, field or additional method, additional type of behavior. Unless if I expect that, I might go and do that. 
But if I don't have anything that distinguishes these two, these four different groups of students, then I might stop there. I might say, okay, undergrad student is just the way I would like to describe all the undergrad students, and they have to be like they have to have some identical behavior, uh, uh, depending, of course, that an identical, yeah, identical behavior um, uh, in my program, and the graduate students as well. We go and do this kind of specialization for shapes as well. So the shapes can have can be further classified into uh, circles, triangles, rectangles, sphere, and cube. Let's say you got a shape, and the, you can, you'd like to compute the area of the shape, and then like you, and then okay, and then you don't know the shape is just a, an abstract way of uh, describing things, okay? And you might. Let's say you might not even have the way how to uh, compute the shape, and we'll discuss about what is that case when you don't know how to compute the area of the shape. What should be what you should be doing in this case, but you know that every shape has a has an area. We'll discuss about that in the next lecture. But the point is, shape has you have a shape, and the shape can compute its area. So, and then the, you know you got a you got a circle, and you know how to compute the circle area. From your geometry classes in triangle or rectangle, and you might have three D shapes as well, sphere and 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 cube, and they might have the volume instead of the the area and so forth. So so you might go and call it like, like a surface area, maybe you might call it. But the point is, you might have these kind of methods and this one, and it might go and continue. You might think about the uh, the employees in a bank account and so forth. Uh, where like employee can be further divided into faculty and stuff, bank account, like for checkings and savings accounts, and so forth. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, so we talked about this kind of hierarchical relationship and the is a relationship. So we might go and consider another example. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we have this university community, and then uh, and then we'd like to describe generalize uh, this university community into an entity called a community member and this community member can be further okay classified into into employee and the student and the alumnus okay so note that we are using a singular nouns okay when we are describing classes okay that's very important so you just use a singular noun don't i mean or or a certain abstract uh, action or something when you're describing classes so make sure that this is some sort of uh, uh, something that describes and it's seen in a singular form so employee or a student and the salams are direct okay uh, children uh, direct descendants of this community member and then we can have further descendants like the faculty and the staff faculty can be further classified into administration and and the teacher and so forth so we can have all these hierarchical relationships but the important thing that we by the way, you just need to know how these things are represented in a UML diagram. So this arrow pointing upwards, okay, means that community member inherits, uh, sorry, the alumnus inherits from the community member, okay. So it, alumnus extends community member, okay. So the, the alumnus is the child class, the community member is the parent class, and this arrow is just pointing towards. This arrow kind of is read from bottom to the top, okay? So from bottom to the top. So administrator is a faculty, faculty is an employee, employee is a community member. So you can go and read it like this if you like, okay? Okay, so uh, from bottom to the top. And this particular symbol, it has a meaning in, in, in the YOML, okay? This means that, that administrating has from faculty, which means that Whatever faculty can do, administrator can do as well. Okay, whatever employee can do, faculty can do that. Administrator can do that too. Okay, not in the same way exactly, but maybe slightly specialized way, but they can do those things. Okay, that's all we need to know. If employee can, okay, if employee can compute its salary, then the faculty should also be computed, can compute its salary, and administrator should also be able to compute his salary. A teacher can also should be able to compute his own salary and so forth. So, and, and that's basically, that should apply. Yeah, but there's, the way how they compute their salaries might be different. But the fact is, they all can compute their salaries. That's the point, right? And administrator might have additional 
methods, let's say register, okay, enroll or uh, enroll a student or something like that, which might not be applicable to a faculty, right? The, not every uh, member of a faculty is engaged in enrolling uh, students or, or uh, unregistering students to a course, but only the administrator has this particular behavior. And the teacher might have like set additional methods, let's say, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, teach or something like that. So that not every, everyone in the faculty is the one who has the method teach. And not every employee has a method called teach and so forth. So you might understand that these are specialized classes and they might have additional uh, methods and, and properties that might not be available to these particular classes, right? And we, we can talk about the same idea in the form of sector for shapes. Again, these, these are the way how we can uh, classify those different shapes into different, let's say, classes and subclasses. Okay, and as I said, the has a relationship uh, is, is contains, it means that certain um, uh, reusability, okay, in the perspective of like using this behavior of the object within the object itself. And, and it's like employee has a birthday, employee has a telephone number. They sort of describe all the, the different type of um, like, relating objects into each other. Okay, so another important concept uh, with the inheritance is, again, as I said, uh, the way how you can go and specialize certain methods that are already implemented in the superclass, right? So, so this is called the overriding, method override or method redefine. Uh, you can go and uh, write more specialized implementation of a given method and, or you can simply go and reuse the existing method uh, of the super, uh, super class. Uh, so you don't want to re-implement this existing things. You just want to keep the things as it is if they are exactly the way how it should be. Okay, so we'll, we'll discuss about the overriding uh, in the, the code uh, later on. But uh, the idea is, again, uh, if I would go back here, like the administrator should be able to redefine its way of computing the salary uh, that is, that should be that can be different from the faculty's salary computation. Okay, administrator should be able to redefine the way how it's, or teacher can, should be able to redefine his way of computing the salary, which could be different for the general faculty member. And also, the teacher should be able to reuse the existing functionality for computing the salary while computing his own salary. Right. So it's not like the teacher has to go and. Uh, re-implement the whole salary computation mechanism from scratch, it can go and reuse the existing functionality for the faculty, but on top of that, it can go and add additional things uh, and then generate his own way of computing the salary, right? Which is kind of a specialized way of computing salary compared to general faculty or compared to the employee, right? And, and the community member might not even have the get salary method because obviously these members do not need that particular method, okay? So, so all of this stuff, okay, um, okay, you need to, to take this into account, and it means that, okay, if teacher redefines the get salary method for, let's say, for the faculty, or compute salary method for faculty, then it means that teacher is overriding the faculty's, okay, compute salary method. It means that the teacher is overriding that, because it's, like re-implementing this existing method in a slightly different way. And we'll see how it basically has, uh, happens. There is another access modifier, uh, apart from public and private. And remember, if we do not put any uh, access modifiers to our class or to our members, that means that they are accessible from the package, from the same package, but they are not accessible from that particular, from outside the package. But we can go and ex apply protected as well. Uh, this a new access modifier called protected and this access modifier is something in between this public and private so what it means is that uh, the all the like the instance variables and the methods uh, uh, of, of a given class super class okay can be used by the subclasses or by the same classes that are in the same package so you need to understand um, this particular class, uh, the members of the protected class 
sorry, the the uh, uh, the protected members of the class uh, can be accessed by the child, by the children of the class, okay, by the sub subclasses, and also by the other classes who might not inherit from the same class, but they're in the same package. So it's similar to kind of uh, like not putting any access modifier, but okay, putting this access modifier also enables the subclasses to okay see what is okay what uh, instance variables and methods they can use. Obviously, the subclasses can okay uh, access uh, the public methods and uh, properties, but it cannot access the private members and the properties okay private uh, methods and properties of the superclass. So if if a given superclass has some private members, okay they are hidden from the outside world, including the subclasses, right? They can, the subclass cannot go and read or, um, okay, or write something to the private members of the class. And it's done with a purpose, okay? And we'll discuss why it's done this way in the likely next slides. But the, the idea is like the, if, if the, uh, the, the, the child class should not be able to go and intervene, interfere, with the implementation of a superclass. And that's the reason why we have this private class, which denotes the implementation of the superclass. Okay, subclass methods can refer to, okay, uh, both protected and sub public members, which is, which is permissible, okay, because while the public members uh, define the interface of the, okay, public interface of the class, protected members do not, okay, uh, uh, determine the public interface of the class. So they are not part of the object objects interface. They cannot be called and reused by some other objects. The protected members can only be reused by children. So this is a particular way of pr propagating the reuse, okay, down to the uh, child classes. Okay, only works for child classes, not anyone else. Okay, no composition a uh, composition type reuse will not be able to call or initiate uh, methods or uh, that are uh, uh, that are uh, uh, that are uh, i mean specified as protected when a subclass method overrides an inherited subclass method then and the super superclass version of the method can be accessed from the subclass by preceding this special keyword called super and dot and the and the name method and I'll, I'll, I'll describe that uh, in this case. So let me go in, into my code here. So as you can see, I prepared two, uh, uh, two, two classes. So I got this community member uh, class here. And this member class has uh, it's just a name, OK? And this name uh, is just a private property called full name, right? And this is the constructor. And the constructor I'm taking um, this full name, right? And I'm assigning it uh, this one. It's just a standard way I create classes. And it also has a method called the get, get name tag. So it basically prints out some sort of a name tag for this particular community member. In this case, it just has, uh, he does, just has the full name and it simply goes and prints out the full name. But I might have another, okay, class called student and the student has the extends, okay? Uh, it uses the extends keyword, which means that student is a direct descendant of a community member. So it inherits from community member class. Note they are basically in the same package, but the, that doesn't matter, okay? The point is I'm using the right namespace so I can go and access the community member. So now, okay, I can go and define the internal state as well, right? Note I'm defining this internal state, okay? So, uh, yeah. So I don't need this particular internal state, by the way. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, I, I don't need this uh, full name. I mean, yeah, let me put it this way. So I got this full name here, it's private, yeah, and I cannot access it from, as I said, I cannot access it from anywhere from my, uh, this one. So if I delete this, 
Okay, I cannot access it from 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 my code code. I cannot say this first name. I cannot say that because okay, this this but this doesn't have. Uh, uh, sorry, the student doesn't have this particular uh, full name because even if it's inheriting it from community member, it, student doesn't have that particular uh, property, right? Because it's hidden inside the parent class and cannot be accessed by parent class. But if I go and let's say if I go and say protected, if I change this part into protected, then I can go and say full name, right? And I can see this in my current object because this particular value, we can say this full name is equal to full name. I can do this. Okay, let me just uh, get rid of this particular keyword. I'll explain what, what, what does this mean. I can do this thing now. Note that I haven't defined full name inside my class, but I'm, ex I'm extending the community member. And now inside a community member, what I made is I made this particular property, okay, field protected, which means the child class can go and use it, okay? The child class can go and use it. I'll explain why it's highlighting later, but the point here is, yeah, let me put it like this. I won't do this kind of error highlight. So, um, okay, so, so now, okay, I can go and access it, right? I can go and access that particular thing because it is, uh, protected. I can go and set it to public as well, and it still will be accessible, okay, uh, to the child class. So that is how we can go and um, play with this thing. Okay, good. So now I'll make it private, right? And um, okay, what I'm doing here is I'm calling the constructor. I'll, I'll come to this particular part later on in the one we're coming to the slides. But what I want you to pay attention here is I'm, I'm calling this super. Okay, I would like to, um, what I'm doing is I'm, I got this get name tag method, right? I got this get name tag method and this, yeah, by the way, I'm initializing all these values, right? So, and this, this constructor for the student is different from the constructor of the community member, right? That that can be fine. That's okay. You can have different types of constructors, even though you're even if you're ex ex extending the community member, and then you might have some additional, okay, um, properties. In this case, we got level in the course, and so the student has a level of in the course. So we can go and ask them in our constructor, and then initialize these values, okay? And an important thing, another important thing I'm here doing here is. That I'm going and uh, re-implementing, re-implementing this get name tag method that is defined in my parent class, community member class. I'm re-implementing this. Okay, so because I don't want this just to print out the name, right? If I do not implement it, let me go and not implement it, not implement it, and just leave it as it is, right? And let's go back into the code where I initiate, instantiate two different classes. So I say community member M, okay, and this I'm just initializing the full name. Here I'm providing three important details, and I call the get uh, name tag method for both. Right? Note I haven't implemented the get name tag method for the student. Okay, and because because I'm reusing the public because because this student okay inherits all the functionality all the public and protected functionality of the community member class so it is student is a community member so student so all the meth all the public interface that is available to the community member is also available to the student okay and therefore i can call i can call this get uh, name tag because student is a community member, and the community member has a get name tag. So I can treat the student as a community member, and that's why I'm calling the get name tag method here and there. Okay, so let me go and call that method. Let me see what, what, what I'm going to see right now. 
and it basically prints out my name, right? So, uh, and then the student's name. So, and basically doesn't do anything with these values, right? It doesn't do anything. It basically does the standard behavior. It simply prints out the name, right? But now I just want to slightly embellish the existing behavior. So I just want to print the name, but below the name, I would like to maybe not below, maybe I want to put some dash here and then, okay, print the, uh, the, the, the year and the, uh, and, the, and the course for that particular student. So not just the name, but some additional information about that particular, okay, uh, student, let's say. So how can I do this? Okay, should I go and, and, and uh, okay, uh, this one? So I can go and re-implement the existing method. So in order to re-implement the existing method, what I do is I say, okay, I put this annotation called all right. We'll discuss about that in the slides later on. But, and, and the reason why you need this all right. But uh, the important thing is now I have a method with the same signature as in the community member. Okay, it's the same signature. Okay, it, it, it's the name is the same and the number of and the order and the type of the arguments. In this case, no arguments. Okay, uh, uh, is the same. We, we, uh, we ignore the, the type, but here, the point here is we are, okay, we are having, uh, we are having a method with the same signature. And now we can go and re-implement this method. We can re-implement it from, from the beginning, right? So now I can go and, okay, now I'd like to put the student name first and then uh, this one, I can go and say this full name. Oh, can I do the full name? No, I can't. I have no access to this full name because it's private. It's implementation of this particular method, uh, sorry, class. It's implementation and I have no access from the child class. I have no access to this implementation. But I would like to print the student name. What should I do? Because I'm just modifying the existing functionality. So now I can reuse, okay, the method of my parent. I know that my method, my parent, has a get name tag method. So I can reuse that. I can say super now. The super is a keyword, okay, which refers to the parent, right? And I can go and say get name tag and let me put this uh, column uh, to indicate the level and everything. Okay, so I can go and call this get name tag method, and this what it does is basically executes the community members get name method, which generates your name, and then you slightly embellish this name with additional details that you already have within this particular object, and then return that name tag. And now. If I go and execute this code again, now it goes and prints for 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 community members says Sarah Abdullah, right? For for student now, it goes and executes this specialized method, right? It goes and does, okay? So it goes and does the over, executes the overridden method, okay? And then. So in this particular method, we are reusing the existing functionality and then printing out uh, the, the, the name, okay? So let's go, continue. Okay, good, so um, yeah, methods of a subclass cannot directly access. We, we talked about that, right? So all, all the non-private ones can be accessed, this one, uh, by, by the class. Uh, so declaring private instant variables helps you to test and debug. And it's, uh, yeah, again, uh, things that we, we should we should always think about the implementation part of our classes and make sure that uh, what, what is, which is, which is the implementation of that particular object, it must remain as the implementation of that object and no one else should be able to interfere with this implementation, including the children as well, including the subclasses as well. And we'll talk about that uh, later on just uh, let me introduce you one another example called uh, with the commission employees and the base salary employees, uh, where the commission employees are paid based on the percentage of their salaries as sales, and base uh, salaried commission employees they receive their salary similar to commission employees, but plus to that salary they have to uh, uh, get some fixed amount, fixed salary. So and uh, we know that both um, 
uh, all the objects in Java extend from object. So you can look into this and says it extends extends object. It says extends object. But this part is absolutely redundant. You can simply if, remove this particular part and then leave this. Uh, uh, okay, leave this thing un, uh, uh, empty. So this is basically the definition of the uh, commission employee class. And you can see that it has some immutable property method. Members cannot be changed once they are assigned, once they initialized, and uh, some methods for computing okay, uh, the salary. So it basically gets all the details from the constructor. It does the, um, okay, it does the validation checks. Uh, so it's not a negative number and it's not, uh, it's, if it's a rate, it's, it's, it's some number between zero and one and so forth. So you can go and do this, this kind of validation checks inside a constructor. And you can also do repeat the same validation checks, okay, inside uh, this uh, setters and getters, okay? So we got setters and getters here and the setters and the getters here. Uh, there is a reason why we are not using the setters and getters, okay, inside the constructor. And the reason for that, we'll talk about that reason in the next lecture, but the main reason is, okay, there is a rule, like this is a good practice and, and software development, uh, not to call the instance methods within the constructor. Because the instance methods, they, are, they represent the behavior of your object, and your behavior of your ob object depends on the internal state of your object. Inside a constructor, the internal state of your object isn't initialized yet. So it's not consistent yet. Until you exit the constructor, your object's internal state is not, in, in, is not consistent yet. So you can now go and e execute the, okay, the instance methods. But we'll talk about the implications of calling the instance method inside uh, the constructor okay, uh, in the next class and in detail. But the, the general idea is don't call the instance methods, okay, the get, even if it's a getter and setter, don't call the instance method inside the constructor because these methods are the, they are the behavior of an object that rely on the internal state of your object. And this internal state should be in a consistent state, uh, not in an erratic state where this particular behavior is going to be erratic. So when you're doing the constructor, your, your state is not initialized yet. So it means that it's not in a consistent state. So it means that you cannot go and use, okay, the objects uh, instance methods okay so that's why we are kind of forcing ourselves to do this, this kind of repeat uh, but okay uh, but uh, that is uh, okay this kind of validation is okay okay good so um, so we can go and uh, develop the commission okay this is the commission based employee and it basically does the earnings and it has a two string method note that we are using override why we, why we are using this override okay to a two string method okay this override method is overriding the two string method of an object class the object has a method called two string all the object class instances have two string method and this is normally some placeholder method which represents Okay, what is your object? So you can go and print, you can define how you're going to print your object, like how you're going to describe your object in terms of a string. So, and this uh, override means that you are overriding the two string method of the object uh, class from which you are, okay, inheriting this, uh, inher this class. Okay. Okay, good. So there's another thing that you need to understand about um, uh, inheritance is that although you can go and uh, reuse the um, the re reuse the functionality the public functionality protect functionality of your sub su superclass direct superclass of course um, you cannot uh, reuse uh, you, you cannot let's say override uh, the constructors you cannot inherit the constructors either. So the constructors cannot be inherited. They're not at the part of your kind of objects uh, constructor. So, uh, and the reason for that is that the constructor is a special method. It is called when we are creating a new object. And uh, when we are creating a new object, let's say we want to create a horse, for example, right? 
So before we go and create a horse, we should go and create, let's say, the, uh, the, the mammal. And before we go and create the mammal, we should go and create the animal first, right? And uh, so this is the, 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 this is the reason why we cannot uh, have the constructors like inherited from the animal because the way how we create animal is not exactly the same as how we create, let's say, the mammal or how we go create the horse, right? Okay, they, when we go and do those things, initial, initialize the internal state of an a animal, okay, it is just some part of the, some way of how we go and initialize the animal, but it does not relevant to the way how we go and create mammals. Yes, mammals are animals, but the way how we create these two objects are different. And, and, and in Java, in an object-oriented world, we have an idea of saying, if we want to create the child first, you go and first create the father. You cannot go and create a child without having his father life, okay? So the father should be living before you go and create this, this father's child. So you cannot have a child without the living father. So make sure that your father is living, and then you can go and have a child from that father. Okay, so that, that's kind of an intuition behind why and why you cannot have constructors inherited you cannot go and create a father and then use this father as a child right you can have you must have first create a father first and then you go and create uh the the the, the, the child and 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 then the child might have might inherit certain properties and methods behavior from his father and some properties and methods at up to, up to the father and some properties and methods could be overridden okay so consider that some parts could be different some parts could be same and this is the relationship right so um, so yeah class default con constructor okay so what if what if the class the in inherited class doesn't have any uh, specific constraint has a default constructor which is a no argument constructor Okay, then, uh, then what should you do? Okay, should you go and, um, okay, inside your constructor, should you go and call this constructor? No, you don't have to. The default constructors are can be called implicitly within the class. Only if the parent class has a, a, a concrete constructor, which requires a particular set of arguments, then you must call this constructor. So how we can do this, okay? So how we can do this kind of, calls. So here I uh, already illustrated you this example, right? I have a constructor and this constructor requires a particular uh, parameter and this parameter is being passed here. So now if I want to create a student, first I need to go and create the community member. Okay, this is the constructor of the student and now you can see the constructor of the student, okay, requires if i go and re require if i go and delete this thing it's a compilation error if i go and comment this it's a compilation error because now it's because it inherits from the community member the compiler is asking me okay you cannot just create a student out of nowhere you can have to create first okay you have to go and create first the community member the, the, the parent the, the parent of this student you have to go and create the parent of this student. And in order to create the parent of this student, I need to pass some variable. So this is the this parameter I'm passing. I'm creating, and it's always need to be the first line of code. I cannot put it here. You can see it is highlighting my code. I cannot do this. It always needs to be the first line in my constructor, student constructor, and the next thing is just the uh, embellishments, the decorations that I'm doing further into this particular class, in the student class. But I always need to go and call this method. This method will create the parent first, and then the, the rest will go and create the student. Okay, that just initialize the student. And that's how this relationship goes, right? So, of course, if I want to go and create the community member, First, I need to go and create an object. Yes, this is not written here like explicitly like this. It's not written like this. It's redundant, 
Like you can look into this and say, okay, community member extends from an object. Object has a default constructor, which means, okay, no argument is required. So I don't need to go and do something like that. I can go and do something like that, no problem. But it is, it can be, it can be skipped. You don't need this, okay? I can remove this part. Okay, in general, it looks like this. Object has its own constructor. It's a no argument constructor. And community member, while creating a community member, what is really happening is it's calling this method and creating an object first, and then it's going and creating a community member. Okay? If I do something like this here, it goes and calls this method. This method will go and create community member, but in order to create a community member, I have to go and create an object. So it goes and creates object and then creates the community member. So once it creates the community member, it goes down and does the rest for the student. Okay, so that's the this hierarchical relationship. So from student, this constructor, okay, the first constructor that will be executed, finished, will be the always objects constructor. It always executes the objects constructor. And the last constructor that will be executed is the students, the subclasses constructor here. You can see that it gets executed last, only after all of its, okay, uh, ancestors get created. So there is hierarchical relationship and this hierarchical relationship, so I can simply remove this part and I can simply get rid of this part. These are redundant. And this is what actually happens when you do this kind of uh, instantiations. Okay. So, uh, but again, I cannot skip this part. I cannot skip this part because construct, because this community member has a concrete constructor which requires an argument and therefore I must use this constructor otherwise it is a compilation error something that you need to understand as well so let's go back and discuss here further so as I said to string is a is an objects method we discussed this and we also discussed about the override annotation this override annotation is is not a compulsory thing okay so I can I can uh, get, I can simply remove the same thing, okay? And it will still work. So I can remove this override uh, annotation. I can remove this override annotation. If I go and uh, press this, I'm going to see exactly the same message as well, right? So it's an annotation, but why do we need it then if it's not required, it's not uh, uh, compulsory? The reason why it's not uh, required is Let's say if I go and say get name tags, something like that, right? I just made some typo, okay? I just made some typo. Okay, if I don't have, okay, I, I want to override something, but okay, I w went in and then typed in some wrong method. The method that doesn't exist, okay, that doesn't exist uh, inside, let's say, inside the community member. It's a new method. And it's okay, you can have new methods. If you don't have this override method, sorry, override annotation, it's okay, you just created a new, okay, method. And if you go and execute this thing here, it will just execute the default, okay, get name tag method for the parent. And you might come and say and scratch your head and want to say why it's not doing this, why it's not, let's say, uh, specializing this method, why it's not overriding this method. And you might say, okay, it's just doing this method. Why it's doing this method, sorry, this method. Why it's, why not doing this method, right? And you might be looking back and forth and then scratching your hand, trying to find out where is the bug. And then it will be a really difficult bug to catch because, okay, uh, it will not cause any compilation error. It will just be a new, another method, but you're not calling this method here. You're calling this method here, right? So, but, because here your mind is okay saying okay I'm overriding but you're not overriding you're just creating a new method and because the signature is different so therefore it makes sense to go and put this annotation if you put this annotation then you will know it see it's getting highlighted it's a compiler error saying you cannot go and override this method because this method doesn't exist here and now I say oh yeah say I just made a typo so I need to go and write it correctly okay so now you can see, okay, good. Now I know that this method exists here and I'm simply overriding this method. And the reason why you put this annotation is that 
you want to identify these kind of typos during the compilation time, not during the runtime. Okay, so if you can eliminate these kind of errors, bugs during the comp compilation time, it's very easy. It's just even these kind of IDEs, they always highlight this kind of stuff. Okay, you don't even need to go and search for them. You just simply simply see that there is a problem and you can go and easily fix that. Okay, so that's the reason why people go and put this annotation. And I think it's really helpful if you do this as well. Okay, good. So, um, okay, so... Um, so we got, yeah, um, another important thing. Uh, so when we are doing the overriding, okay, um, our, let's say we define a method called a public method. We go and say this is a public method, right? So this public method is a get name and all, all, all that stuff, right? And, and this, sorry, this uh, community member defined this public method called get name tag method. So, and here we also define, we are putting this public access modifier here, right? We're putting it here. So we cannot, and, and, and this particular method has a, a bigger uh, scope. It can be accessed by any other class, anyone by the, in the outside world. So when we are doing the overriding, we cannot restrict the method's scope, uh, visibility further. Okay, we cannot go and say, protect it. And it will be a problem. It even highlights that, right? So it was, it was public and sees there is a related problem. IDs are smart today, right? So it says, okay, this this is a public. Now you're trying to restrict this method's visibility, okay? So this this violates what? This violates an is a relationship, yeah? Because now this particular method is a protected. It cannot be accessed from this one, but it cannot be accessed from the student. It can be accessed by the community member, but it, the student get name tag method is not visible to the outside world now, right? But we know that student student is a community member, right? And the community member has a get name tag method. We know that the student is a community member. Yes, it is a student. He's a student, but he's also a community member, right? And the community member, okay, has this method. So then, okay, this okay, pr this protected is violating this relationship. Okay, the student is not a community member because it can it doesn't have this method. You got the idea? It doesn't have this method. So therefore, we cannot do more restrictive access to this one. Okay. So I can go and uh, not use the private as well, but I can only use public here. What is the the, the, the opposite? Let's say I got some protected uh, method. So the protected, let's say string greet method. Yeah, and it says, let's say hello. Okay, now I can go and use it er 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 anywhere in my code and I can even override this because it's a child class, right? Sorry, can make it protected, right? Greet. And say, say, um, Good morning, something like that. And as you can see, this basically greet method is, okay, it's in overriding this ex existing greet method, right? It's overriding, it's, it used to be a greet uh, um, and then this one. But okay, this greet method cannot be accessed from the outside world because it's protected, cannot be accessed. It can be accessed within the same package, but here it cannot be accessed. Okay, that, but I can go and change its access modifier to public. I mean, the, the other way around is okay because it doesn't violate, okay, the is a relationship. Because in the, for the community member, I cannot call greet, okay? Yeah, I mean, I can call it for student, 
No problem, I can call it for student, but for a community member, I cannot call it. Okay, it's okay. Community member is not expecting this method to be available. Okay, so uh, and and okay, I and 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 I don't, I, I mean, I, the student is a still community member, still community member, it's doing something more, right? It's doing something more, it can now greet. It can now greet, but you were not expecting this thing from the community member because it's protected. It's protected. You got it. And you were expecting it. Okay, you, you, you can go and expect it from the student because student is embellishing and decorating community member with additional methods. Okay, and it can go and do override for the uh, protected member as well. So it can go and loosen up the restriction for the methods. Okay. Okay, if it's more restrictive here on the parent class, the, the subclass can go and loosen it up. But if it's okay, uh, if it's public, let's say here, then uh, the subclass cannot go and restrict it further because it violates the easy relationship between these classes. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so there is an example here, and this example has um, uh, basically creates this commission employee and sets it, and we can go and run this example. Now we can go and create uh, another class called base plus commission employee, <coughs> which is exactly the same as the commission employee class. It basically uh, does the computation uh, in the same way. So, but instead, it just simply goes and adds additional uh, field called base salary. But most of the fields are exactly the same. Note that it's not inheriting from anything. It basically, it's inheriting from object. So it's basically recreating the commission employee, right? So all of its functionality is a basically a copy paste, include just with small modifications to, let's say, base salary and get base salary methods. So, and the way how it prints out this salary is slightly different, right? So. So of course this is this is wrong. This, you don't have to be doing it this way because you are okay repeating exactly the same properties. You're repeating exactly the same methods. Get last name, get social security. All of these methods already exist and implemented. You don't have to do this at all. Even if you're just adding a couple of new methods. So what you can do is okay, and you can basically use it the way you want. What you can use it okay is um, you can do the inheritance and in the inheritance part what you can see is you're eliminating a lot of this repeated code you're not typing it in you're basically relying to the commission employee to okay do the uh, the things that are related to this particular employee but you're adding additional field you're adding this base salary field into the constructor and then okay creating the commission employee Okay, here, and then you're just adding this validation and initializing this uh, uh, additional field that you have for this particular type of an employee. And setters and getters you introduce, they just uh, remain. And the way how you compute the earnings and uh, two string uh, could be erratic as well because you're using what? You're using the private variables of the superclass. So remember, let me let me just uh, not slide through this one. I have this particular class here. My uh, this one. Let me open this commission employee. Okay, we have this particular properties of the commission employee set as private, and we got getters and setters here, right? These are the getters and setters because we would like to hide the implementation of the commission employee. And if we go and use this private, okay, variables inside. This subclass, obviously, we are going to have errors. And we don't want this to happen. So what should we do? Okay, of course, we can go and uh, uh, set, set, um, yeah, uh, so we discussed about that. We can go and set all these fields to protect it, right? If we go and set these fields to protect it, then obviously, we can go and uh, access all these fields and obviously you can go and see that, that there is no error here right so but this is not desired uh, behavior why because uh, 
because again, this is the implementation of your commission employee. You don't want it to, to, this to be exposed to the outside world. Okay. Uh, you want what you want is um, okay. Uh, you want it to be internal and in, in, implicit because uh, uh, the first thing is uh, let's say you want to go and um, if, if it's let's say if it's protected and your subclasses can go and uh, interfere with this uh, implementation let's say uh, the gross salary is a protected or commission rate let's say private commission rate is now protected So if commission rate is protected, then it means it exposes this particular value. So now this is protected, this particular variable is protected. It exposes this particular uh, variable to this child class. And I can go and extend from any class, right? Let's say someone else, some old good programmer developed that, and it knows how to implement all that stuff. I'm a new programmer, I'm a junior programmer. And I'm developing this code, and uh, and I got this uh, initialized method, and I'm the initialized. I can go and say, okay, commission rate is equal to, I don't know, hundred percent, okay, or I don't know, twenty percent, something like that. I I I'm an I'm a newbie. I don't know what is inside this one. I just went on and initialized it like this, okay, and. So, so now, okay, I initialize it like this. Now, now what I have is my commission employee. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes and, I mean, when it's initializing itself, it goes into a great length of checking whether this thing is in between zero or one, okay? And if it's not, then it basically goes and does all that stuff. If, it's, if this number is greater than one, then obviously this object is in an in, 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 in incorrect state. So it cannot go and generate earnings and all that stuff because it, its state is inconsistent. It cannot work, okay, if this particular values uh, commission rate is not within this range, yeah? But now I'm a newbie, newbie programmer. I went on and I just said it like this. Now somewhere and I'm, I, I would like to go and use, okay, uh, uh, let's say reuse the existing. I can go and use reuse the existing method. So I can say earnings, right? I don't need to multiply that. So now I can go and use the earnings method. And this earnings method belongs to this method, right? So now basically does the multiplication. But will this produce me any meaningful answer? Obviously not. Because I'm initializing this protected variable with the wrong data from my base class, okay, uh, from my uh, subclass, I'm also messing up the internal state of this parent class. And by messing it up, by messing up the internal state, I'm also messing up its methods, okay? And these methods cannot be now, cons cannot give me some reliable answer because I messed up its state. Because I'm a newbie programmer, I don't know what is there, and I must not know what is there, okay? Even if I'm not a newbie programmer, I just don't need to go and, and, and know, understand what is there. But with, even without understanding things, I can go and mess it up inside that particular thing. So that should be prevented. I should not be able to do this, okay? If I can go and mess it up inside there, inside here, then, okay, this particular object is not sealed well. It's not encapsulated well. It has to be encapsulated in such a way that no one can go and mess up the internal state inside this particular object, right? So that's the reason, that's the reason I cannot go and make this particular uh, field protected. Even the protected thing is actually exists. The recommended practice is Make all your internal states private. Provide some accessors and, and mutators, in this case, mutators, to these states. So in your mutators, you can go and check for consistency. If, if, if this value is a consistent value for this object. 
in this case, okay, it's a compilation error, I cannot do anything. That's the one big benefit of defining your internal state as private. Don't use protected, okay, uh, when you're defining things. Another important thing is, of course, debugging, okay? So when you, you, you might, you, this particular class, okay, uh, you might not know, you, you have the implementation and assignment and all that changes and earnings, okay, in one place. Right? So if you want to debug something, uh, like you want to see how this state of your object gets changed, you can always put the okay, uh, uh, endpoint here, and it always hits this point. Okay? So you don't have to go and search for the child class, which is trying to modify something inside your object. You don't have to do this. You know where this particular state is getting modified. It's getting modified inside this particular set method. So you can simply go and put this debug here. And if anything is going to try to change something, you're going to see what kind of change it's making and see if it's consistent or not. And if it's not consistent, you can go and add additional okay, if statement to check whether that particular state is avoided or not. So it makes it localizes okay, the changes that you need to go and look for, I mean, uh, the, your code. So if every, anything gets changed, it, it, it gets changed locally. Okay? And if, if you go and change this particular variable to from gorse sales to gorse sales uh, of the year or something like that, right, or of the month, okay, it will not affect anything in in the in the inheriting classes like this, because they they rely on, okay, these methods, okay, this implementation changes should not affect neither the objects, okay, classes that are using uh, this particular class or inheriting from this class, okay? So, so you just need to understand that this changes will not be, uh, okay, spilled to the outside. Uh, any change of, into the implementation of this class should not spill outside this class. It should be localized within this class. That's the mindset that you should have when you're writing things like this, okay? Make, make sure that you have things that are private and understand the effect of uh, the influence or impact of these changes how these changes are going to be spilled into the classes, whether you, they are using it, or into the child classes they're inheriting from it, okay? So these are two things that you need to you care about when you define these kind of things. Okay, then you might say, why do we need protected at all? Protected can be used most of the times for passing some methods to the child classes, some pre-implemented methods that, let's say, child classes might go and use, might find it helpful. Okay, some methods can be marked as protected uh, because child classes might find it useful because they kind of share this particular method across, the, the parent can share this method across all the child, children, okay, and the children can simply use those kind of helper methods, okay, it's not like a, like private is a helper method for that particular class, right, so if any private method that you specify is just a helper method only for that class, but a protected method is a helper method for the class itself and for its children, okay? So you might think, okay, the protected is something that we need to use for helper methods that is applicable for the class and its children, okay? That's something where we need to go and use the protected keyword. Okay, good, so um, yeah, we discussed about these things, okay? So the, so the, if, if with a, with a protected var instance, okay, variables, if you, if you have a, a class, a super class with a protected instance variables, right, then that particular class is normally called uh, fragile and brittle. A small change in this uh, super class can break the subclass implementation. So that's something that you need to understand. Make sure that you don't, so any change inside the implementation of a super class does not affect, does not affect the implementation of the subclasses, okay? You don't have to go and ch make changes in the subclasses, okay? And any change that subclass makes, okay, should not affect, should not, okay, break the consistency of your superclass. The sub, 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 subclasses should not be able to intervene into the implementation of your superclasses. That's also an you know, important thing that you need to remember when you're building these kind of relationships. Okay, um, so one thing you need to understand is protected uh, access modifier is not only for child classes, it's also uh, 
makes your uh, class members uh, visible to the other classes within the same package. Okay, so you need to understand that one. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, um, so we talked about the localizing the effects, and um, yeah, and so we are using these getters and setters throughout our class for the employer condition employee, and uh, and then this is how we are implementing the same thing, right? And uh, this is our base plus commission employee, which is also uh, using uh, getters and setters. And note that I'm using okay the superclasses earnings method to compute the salary uh, with a percentage, and then simply adding up the base salary to that to generate a new earnings. So I'm overriding the existing one. And the same thing goes okay for string. I'm generating the string for okay for the beta, for the commission employee first and then just appending additional field get base salary this one and basically i'm not re-implementing these two string methods and get endings method again i'm just reusing the existing ones okay um yeah um uh, we talked about that yeah so super being able to use things are super so uh yeah if even this multiplication right isn't these things if you, if you see that your inher inher your parent classes do something even partially, make sure that you call those methods. So this uh, prevents you from duplicating the same logic over and over again, even if it's just modified logic, okay? Uh, this method does the job partially, just use that partially. So this way, if you want to go and make changes, okay? You get you go and make changes in one place. You don't have to go and make changes in multiple different places, right? So if you're if you're computing uh, the earnings for the commission employees um, in a different way, then you just go and make changes in the commission employee. But that would all that change will also apply now to okay base plus commission employee because base plus commission employee is a commission employee, right? Therefore, any change you make to this one, any way how you change the salary computation to commission employee, it also affects this guy okay and 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 this guy just does some embellishment some decoration some additional work on top of something like that so this change will be okay uh, applied uh, here as well but you're also doing something else you're adding this one so this logic will remain as uh, you defined it here so this is kind of a general recommendation a good practice always try to reuse the methods that you already have when you're overriding the method of course okay uh, reuse what is already existing inside your parent classes uh, and, 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 and over, while overriding things, try to think what you can do on top of something that you already wrote for the parent class. Right? Something that you should be thinking in that perspective. Okay, that makes it a good software engineering practice. Okay, good. So, um, and now let's uh, yeah talk about the, the relationship between the constructors. Um, so uh, the relationship between the constructors, okay, is as I said earlier, they, uh, uh, the the original subclass constructor is basically finishes its executing last. Always the object's constructor gets executed first, and there is a chain of okay uh, execute constructor calls in between. So we 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 discussed about that, and. Um, and there is a chain, right? And and you always need to talk about. I've already explained that to you in the code. So let's quickly go through the object class, which is the parent class for all classes in Java. Right? It's a parent class. It's the uh, every class in the in the Java gets uh, uh, inherits from this object class. This object class has a bunch of methods. And we can go and override some of these some of its methods, right? So the equals method is uh, is a method which uh, checks if these two objects are equal or not, right? So this equals basically checks uh, if two objects are are the same by their reference. But sometimes you don't want to check things by reference. Sometimes you don't you want to check things by let's say by ID. Let me go and define let's say a new uh, a parameter called let's say private. Uh, um, string and let's say student ID okay 
and I should provide the ID as well now, which is a string, and the, the uh, student ID. So I'll go and say this uh, student ID is equal to student ID. So let me let me make a getter now. Let me make a getter now. Okay. So let's just make a getter to this private uh, variable. So I'll say public uh, string get student ID. Yeah, and I just simply return this value. Okay. Yeah. Now what I what I want to do next is it says I have to pass the student ID now. So let's go in. Uh, yeah, uh, let's say something like that. Right? So go and do something. Uh, your, your, your year is 19. Uh, something like that, right? So I can go and uh, create another student. Let me call this as student one and student two. Yeah, and uh, and see they have the same IDs and everything. And now I would like to print out. Let me just uh, comment this out as well. I have to uh, print out uh, if S1 equals see this equals okay equals operator. Uh, sorry, the uh, function comes from the object and it expects an object. So I have to go and pass S2 because S2 is, is a student and as well, he's, it's an, he's an object. It's okay. So now I just want to see if it's true or false. And what do you think is going to be true or false? We initialize them exactly in the same way as they are. And it is false. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like even if the ID is the same, as if the name is the same, these are two different objects. An object, like okay, equals method, what it normally does is simply goes and checks the reference for this particular object and the reference for this particular object. And obviously these are two different objects. Their references are going to be different. And obviously they are not equal to each other, right? But what if we would like to override this method? But we'd like to say, okay, this equals has a different meaning in the context of objects, right? We'd like to compare their IDs. And if their IDs are the same, then these two objects are the same. They are exactly the same. We don't care about the, where they're stored, okay? Their reference numbers. All we know, all we want to know is this object is equal to this object or not, okay? So how we can go and do this, we can go and override, so, sorry, override. And this ID is a really, really nice thing to do. And it basically shows you, okay, uh, which method you would like to, uh, um, which method you would like to override. And I can say, okay, there are two, okay, parent, the two classes in the hierarchy. It basically inherits from the community member and then community member inherits from the object. But I can go and override the objects equals method. So I can go and select this one. And it already just generates you this code, but I'd like to change it slightly a bit different. So I'm not going to use the default implementation. I want to use my own implementation. So how I impl uh, use my own implementation? Yeah. So first of all, I okay, I uh, I take this thing as an as a as an object, right? But I cannot go and write student here because that will be a violation. I'm restricting okay I'm restricting this equals method so this equals like, like as if I'm restricting this public access modifier I'm also restricting the available uh, available arguments that this particular method can take because okay the the parent of this class can take objects as an argument but the subclass is restricting the range of arguments this particular method is getting so it means that this particular subclass which is student is not an object, right? Because object can take objects. Why student cannot take objects? So let's make object 
Okay, let's make the arguments as it is. So that way we are not violating, okay, is a relationship in this case. So we'll talk about this particular thing in the next lecture in detail, but uh, the idea here is the subclass cannot restrict, cannot restrain uh, the parent class, okay? Think from that perspective, like you're a child, you cannot, okay, restrict your father, okay? But you can expand, uh, you can add on top of what your father can do, okay? Good, so, um, good, so how can you go and do the checks, okay, in this case, right? So, um, yeah, you can do some casting here, right, which is... Um, so you can say student, not, not casting, say s2 is equal to object and so we're doing some explicit casting here and we know how to do this casting, right? Um, so we're saying this object uh, that we are getting is in fact has to be a student because uh, we want this uh, to be, uh, okay, uh, to have a property of student ID, right? So I can go and now return this student ID is equal to S2 student ID of student ID, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, I can go and use the, I can go and use the private variable, but now I can, um, uh, I, I can go and use the, uh, because it's in the same class, I can go and use the the accessor. Let me go and use the accessor because I don't want it to be dependent on the internal state, right? But it's the only place where I can refer to. Okay, good, good. So now I over uh, written this particular method, right? So what I can do now is so now I can do the same check here. But now, in this particular example, I would like to, I expect this to be true because these two strings are the same. Let me go and run that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So uh, now it says true, right? Because indeed these are uh, the same students. If I change the IDs of these students, if it says false, right? Good. So now I have the, the, the appropriate logic uh, for, for comparing two objects and checking if these two objects are equal or not. And I'm doing it by overriding the equals method of the object, okay, uh, to my own, own logic. So I'm getting the argument to which I would like to compare the object and I'm just doing it, okay, uh, that, I, that, that I mean I should be doing it and appropriately. Okay, there are other methods as well. Um, like two string, we already did this. We'll talk about this wait, notify, and notify all methods when we talk about multi-threading, okay, in the, in the second half of the semester. The get uh, class method for the object, again, uh, is, um, uh, will return you a, a special type of, a, of an object called the class type, okay, so the class, that, uh, you, might, you might laugh, but class actually also inherits from the object, is a different type of a class. Class called class, right? There's a special uh, class called class, and it basically contains some fields that describe the class itself, like the class name, okay? And maybe some it's, some of its properties and then methods and so forth. So all of these things, idea of some meta information about the class uh, is stored in a class object, okay? And you can go and get this object by calling the get class method. This get class method returns you an object of a type class which contains information about the class name, class properties, and also all the metadata related to that particular class. The finalize method is, again, we talked about that. It's a, it's a garbage collector. It's called by garbage collector to prepare the object for removal. Okay, and the, finally, we have the clone method. This clone method is also a useful method for objects. Uh, it is used to cre uh, create the shallow copy of the object. Okay, so as we know that objects uh, are reference types and and when we are like modifying certain properties of the objects, uh, we are basically modifying it globally, right? So we cannot make things locally. 
So in order to make things locally, we need to go and create the, the copy of the object, the clone of the object. So we have to create a new object, at least with the same uh, values. So the sh what is the shallow copy? The shallow copy is, okay, um, uh, it basically uh, creates the a new object, right? And if this object has primitive data types, let's say uh, the, the age, for example, we've we got a student here, right? And we would like to create a shallow copy of the student. What is the shallow copy of the student? So the shallow copy of the student is, okay, it has this uh, level and it has the course and it has student ID. All of these values are, uh, uh, they can be copied, they will be copied into a new object. And the object will be initialized with all these values. But what if this inside it has uh, some, I don't know, some array, okay, some, let's say, courses, or, I don't know, marks, something like that. And in this case, the marks is integer. So the array is, array is a reference type, right? So, and uh, the object will not get into the reference type and then copy all of its, okay, elements into a new place in the memory. Instead, it will copy the reference to this array, okay? So whenever it's creating a new student, okay, it, it is cloning the student, okay? Uh, it simply copies all the primitive types into a new place in the memory. So if you go and change these values for a cloned object, it will not affect the original object. But if you go and make changes to this particular property, then it will go and affect the original object because it copies the reference to the reference properties, reference types, right? So you need to understand that. So it's just a shallow copy. It doesn't do the deep copy, which is, uh, which is kind of a difficult task to do. You need to go and do it. You can go and do it manually if you want to. Uh, and how you do it manually, you just need to go and, okay, again, override the clone method for your object and decide which properties you'd like to reinitialize. Maybe the marks, you would like to reinitialize a new array and then create, uh, copy all the elements from the array into that new array. And then uh, this way, how you go and do the deep copy for the student. But the shallow copy is copying all the primitive types and, uh, okay, and, uh, uh, and, and then copy the reference types as if they are reference types into the object, uh, into the cloned object, and then give you this new object, right? That's how you uh, will do the cloning. And cloning is very particularly important when you're talking about, uh, this cloning actually is com commonly used, especially when you're doing some algorithms where you're, uh, you're creating a certain sort of a path, path states, states, uh, path made of states, and you'd like to keep every state uh, in, in, in track, right? So you clone from one state to another state, and then you modify this state, okay? And then so forth. So and then you got what you got is a chain of states, okay? So, you, so every state is kind of stored in some place. So you're dealing with certain algorithms, certain uh, the learning problems, okay? Where you need to keep track of every state you've been and then you would like to, uh, okay, if state is represented as some sort of an object, then you'd like to copy from that state object, new objects, and then create more objects and so forth. So clone is, is particularly useful in that perspective. Uh, and, uh, and you might be thinking how you can go and do these kind of customizations for the clone uh, if you want the deep copy. But you can simply use the default copy, which is a shallow copy. Okay. So uh, I think that shall conclude our lecture today, and I hope it was useful. So we got some understanding about inheritance. Uh, we'll see how this inheritance is particularly applicable in, 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 in certain design problems that we will be discussing in the lecture seven. Um, but uh, right now, I think we've got the, a good grasp of the concept itself, the concept of inheritance. It's, it's, gener it's from generalization, from specializ generalization to the specialization. It uh, promotes reusability, maintainability, and scalability through uh, this uh, relationship between uh, sub superclass and subclass. Okay, thank you for your attention, and see you in the risks.